Hello everybody, welcome. We'd like to go ahead and get started. And thank you so much for joining us today for this presentation. I'm Brandi Nanaki. I direct the Citrus Policy Lab, where we support interdisciplinary tech policy research and engagement. And I'm also newly minted associate research professor at the Goldman School of Public Policy. Today we're honored to host Travis Mosier today for his presentation, U.S. Chips and Science Act, what it means for the future of, well, everything. Travis's talk was made possible through the generous support from Citrus and the Banatow Institute, the Berkeley Risk and Security Lab, the Berkeley Center for Security and Politics, the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology, the Berkeley Roundtable on the International Economy, and Skydeck. So a lot of groups on campus are very invested in hearing what you have to say today. Uh, a bit of housekeeping though before we get started, uh, please hold your questions until the end of the presentation. We will be going around with handheld mics. The presentation is going to be recorded, so if you could please wait to ask your question until you have that microphone so that we can capture the audio, we would greatly appreciate it. So I'll give a quick uh, bio of Travis before I hand it off to him. Travis Mosier is a technology semiconductor and global policy expert with a distinguished track record spearheading federal initiatives that have improved market access, increased exports, enhanced the domestic investment climate, and strengthened supply chain resiliency. He spent the last 12 years serving in the U.S. Department of Commerce, where he was awarded the department's highest honor, the gold medal for his work on semiconductor supply chain resiliency. Just a quick uh, applause for that, thank you. <laughs> Travis is one of the four, sorry, Travis is one of the foremost experts in the nexus between national security, industry, and technology, and played an early role in the implementation of the U.S. Chips and Science Act. Today, he'll present the case for how semiconductors drive geostrategic competition append established markets and supply chains, and how these, these little microchips will shape the future of everything as we know it. Before I hand it over, I have to tell you last night, I took apart an old remote and ripped it open. My husband was wondering what the heck I was doing, just so I could show you a little <laughs> microchip. So with that, let me please pass it to Travis. Thank you again for coming. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for being here. Uh, I'd first like to thank the University of California, Berkeley, uh, the Goldman School of Public Policy, Skydeck, uh, and all the other ones that she mentioned that really made this possible today. Uh, I'd really like to thank you, Brandy, uh, Jean, and David specifically for all your, your hard work uh, to make this, make this happen. I'm deeply appreciative um, of your time. And then a hearty thank you to you, the audience, for taking the time today to be here. Uh, I believe you will find it illuminating and hopefully somewhat entertaining. Uh, and I'm incredibly honored, uh, again, to, and excited to be here. So just a little bit of uh, background on me so you all know where I'm coming from. Uh, after college, I lived in China for eight years and then came back to the States to get my master's in international affairs. Uh, from Columbia University, and then after I graduated, headed uh, down to D.C. to work for the Commerce Department, uh, where my semiconductor journey uh, began. So over the course of 12 years and three administrations, I became the semiconductor industry policy lead at Commerce. Starting at the China desk, our China trade desk at Commerce, I moved over uh, to the industry analysis unit, the uh, International Trade Administration, to uh, cover semiconductors full time. Now today, I work as executive advisor at My Silicon Compass, which is a small boutique consulting firm, uh, really focused on bringing value add to our clients, uh, advancing their technological competitiveness, expanding public-private partnerships, and uh, increasing jobs and investments right here in the United States. I also have the pleasure of being a senior adjunct fellow at the Center for New American Security, a, a think tank in DC at the nexus of national security, uh, uh, technology, and uh, trade. So for the next hour, I'm looking forward to geeking out with you a little bit on uh, semiconductors and why everyone should care about them. Uh, I'll start with a bit of background in the semiconductor supply chain and its history and how it all kind of works. And I'm going to also speak to the recent events uh, that led us to this moment, the semiconductor shortage, 
the China's semiconductor industry development and how it all led to the semiconductor export restrictions that we've been reading about in the media, and then obviously the Chips and Science Act. I'll end it by tying it all together with what comes next and leaving plenty of time for your questions. So bear with me, we're looking at about 30 to 35 minutes and then I'm gonna turn it over to you. Um, so as a bit of a scene setter, uh, after preaching the semiconductor gospel for years, it was only two years ago in 2021 that I knew we kind of had reached a tipping point, right? It was a quiet Sunday when my dad called to ask me a question that kind of cemented it for me that we kind of reached uh, a tipping point. Now, you have to understand, my dad is, uh, was born in rural Tennessee in the 1940s, and his only experience outside the South was being uh, shipped over to Germany after being uh, uh, you know, called up to serve in Vietnam. Uh, he called me up and he asked me in his, you know, in his southern drawl, you know, are semiconductors made out of sand? And when he said that, I kind of, I'm like, my dad's asking me about semiconductors. I think we've made it. Um, even the world of high fashion is paying attention to this sector and the Ch Chips and Science Act. Uh, it's true. Uh, I have a quote here from a world-renowned uh, a world-renowned fashion, high fashion uh, designer, Jacobi Mugatu, I think says it best all. <laughs> if you know, you know. <laughs> Seriously though, for years there's been this growing concern among the policy community uh, in DC about the billions that China was spending uh, in the, in the, to develop its domestic semiconductor capabilities and its implications for US national security, technology, economic competitiveness, and about the fact that we were one invasion away from the US and its allies potentially losing access to the world's most advanced semiconductors. And there were more general concerns as well, especially about the R&D uh, trajectory uh, of silicon te technology and the slowing of Moore's law. But more generally, policymakers in the, in the United States were also concerned about the loss of U.S. manufacturing ca capabilities here in the United States. So it's kind of under these circumstances that the U.S. Chips and Science Act was born. But I argue that, and I've talked to a lot of my colleagues as well, it's really the shortage of semiconductors that really began in late 2020, and it's continu that's continuing today, that was the factor that kind of finally brought this importance of this technology to the forefront of the public consciousness. Um, and I argue help push the CHIPS Act over the finish line as far as fully funded from Washington. Do you remember when you couldn't buy a car? Oh, that was semiconductors, right? For me, I know in the midst of the pandemic, I had a lot of time on my hands. I was looking for an Xbox, couldn't find one. Semiconductors, right? So, you know, and, and I, I believe some, in some ways, in kind of a meta example, uh, today's lecture is further evidence of the importance of this tiny, indescribably complex technology made from sand is finally getting its due in the public consciousness and the public discourse, and, and not a moment too soon. So before we jump into how we got here and what it means for innovation, great power competition, and global supply chains, I'm going to give you a brief primer on the technology supply chains, the process steps, and some of the terms that are frequently used. I think it's really important because you're going to still be hearing about this stuff as we march into the future. So I think it's good to understand exactly what we're talking about when we talk about semiconductors. So let's talk about definitions first, right? You have integrated circuit, you have semiconductor, microchip, or sometimes you have microelectronics, which is known and talked about in the defense uh, intelligence community. Or you also hear them simply referred to as chips. Uh, these are all kind of used interchangeably. They are distinctions, but in the world that I work in, they're used interchangeably. So if you hear that, it all means the same thing. It's also important to understand there are many players at many stages that come together to make a chip. I say it takes a village to transform uh, sand into the world's most complex technology. Uh, you have some companies that focus solely on the design of the chip, right? You have Literally thousands of engineer, engineers that are acting as city, city planners, but at the microscopic scale. They're kind of like the, you know, yeah, that's what they are. They're really city planners at the microscopic scale. Supporting the designer, designers are EDA firms, or Electronic Design Automation. EDA is the software 
that des these designers are using for chip layouts. It's like CAD for architects. It's exactly the same concept. Um, and of course, you have the equipment that makes chips. Then you have some companies that just manufacture chips for design firms. These, are, these types are called foundries or contract manufacturers. And next, you have a lot of small companies that specialize in testing and packaging those chips once they're, they've been manufactured. Uh, and th those, that kind of part of the process, the supply chain is located in Southeast Asia and, and China. And then finally, you have what are called IDMs, or Integrated Device Manufacturers. Uh, they kind of do all those steps in-house. So Intel is a really good example of a traditional IDM. And there are even more players than that. It's a very complex supply chain, but I just, it just proves, I think, how complex the process of making a chip can be, and is. Another key aspect to understand why semiconductors are having their moment has to do with supply chains. I think if there was a phrase or term of 2021, it would be supply chain. And the one supply chain that everybody was, and I would argue obviously still is talking about because I'm here, <laughs> is the semiconductor supply chain. Uh, I would argue that the semiconductor supply chain is the poster child for globalization. Um, <clears throat> you know, given their small size, ease of shipping, free trade flows that have been the kind of the, the norm for the past 50 or 60 years, and other various factors, they have kind of naturally evolved to have specialization across regions. Uh, and that really is the key to understanding in the semiconductor supply chain and where kind of we are now is this regional specialization. Uh, the main semiconductor supply chain regions, and it's pretty finite. You have the United States, of course. You have East Asia, so we're talking about Taiwan, Japan, Korea, and even, even China. And then Southeast Asia, of course, has its role in the back end. And then you have Europe, with each kind of playing its part in some or maybe sometimes all of the process steps. Um, for semiconductor, oh, let me see here. The, the, for example, in semiconductor manufacturing equipment, the United States, Japan, and really the Netherlands are the only game in town when it comes to advanced semiconductor manufacturing equipment. Um, for design, you know, the United States has one ring to rule them all. They really dominate the design space. Um, when you move over and talk about, and germane to our discussion today and some of the things that we're seeing happening on, on, in the CHIPS Act is really to address the manufacturing side of things, the kind of uh, what was seen here in the United States as uh, not enough manufacturing capacity in the United States. So as, as, as an example, uh, the United States right now has roughly only 12% of the global manufacturing capacity, right? That's down from roughly one third of global manufacturing capacity in the uh, 1990s. Not only that, and you'll hear Secretary, Secretary of Commerce, uh, Secretary Mundo say this a lot, but not only do not, we only have 12% of the capacity here, but we don't have any of the most advanced chip manufacturing capacity here in the United States. That's almost predominantly in Taiwan and a little bit in Korea. Um, <clears throat> Now, semiconductor manufacturing is predominantly located in Asia, whether it be the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, the most advanced uh, uh, contract uh, foundry uh, in, the, in the world, or Samsung, or even some US companies have a lot of, uh, of their own manufacturing case capabilities is, uh, is located in Asia. Um, now, this is kind of a very oversimplified picture uh, of the semiconductor supply chain, so I, I, I taking my artistic license, so if there's any electrical engineers in the, in the room, please, I'm, I'm taking that artistic license and I'm running with it. Um, but now that we've kind of level set with process steps and global specialization of the semiconductor supply chain, it's gonna help us better understand all that's kind of come after that, US China, China, uh, US, uh, the US uh, Chips and Science Act and kind of what China is doing in this space and, and why simply why the shortage happened. So thank you for sticking with me through those kind of process steps and details. They're, they're important. They're really important. So moving on to what we've seen in China over the last decade, it really, in my opinion, we can almost thank the government of China for getting the ball rolling on raising this public consciousness that I was mentioning earlier. Uh, what do I mean by that? Back in 2014, the government of China released a blueprint that was basically a blueprint to build a more globally competitive self-sufficient semiconductor industry to be more globally competitive with the world. The main reason behind that was really threefold. 
first, and this is critical to understand, China is almost completely reliant on foreign chip technology. Indeed, microchips have been one of biggest, China's biggest annual imports for over the last couple of decades as a kind of in state for global electronics manufacturing. And then over the last 15 or 20 years, they've become much more of a consumer as well. So this has kind of driven that huge dependency on foreign technology and foreign chips going into China. Second, because of that reliance, the government of China viewed it as an obstacle to moving up the technology value chain. And they really saw becoming more competitive in microchips, manufacturing, design, all the stages. They saw that really as an economic and national security imperative, especially given the growing ubiquity of chips in pretty much everything out there. So finally, I, you know, China really understands, and I think we are all starting to understand, that chip innovation drives the advancement of emerging technologies, including, I mean, you name it, supercomputing, machine learning, artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, the, the, the advances in chip technology are making these kind of technologies possible, and China, China, understood, China understands that. So since 2014, roughly, uh, China has been uh, has leveraged between 150 and 200 billion dollars uh, of state funding directed towards the goal of, of increasing f uh, its own its own capacity in the sector. Um, now, in most a lot of that funding, uh, that state funding from China has really gone to what has been a really unprecedented build out of China's semiconductor manufacturing capabilities. Uh, for example, in 2018, China alone accounted for half of worldwide construction spending on these manufacturing facilities called FABs. Now, I'm going over a lot very quickly here. I'm giving you the two-minute two elevator pitch on China. But really, if you fast forward to the, the 2020s, over the last couple of years, despite this Herculean effort and these, these industrial policy, strong support from China's leadership, billions of dollars in subsidies. There's really, I think you could argue and that China has seen the results as, as very disappointing. I mean, don't take my word for it. This is kind of evidenced by, there's been a lot of projects that have gone bankrupt, a lot of Chinese semiconductor companies that have gone bankrupt. And most recently, you're seeing corruption probes uh, of, of the leadership that have been driving a lot of, that have been responsible for getting China's semiconductor up and running. There's corruption probes because uh, driven by Chinese leadership anger at this lack of progress. I think I was reading in the Wall Street Journal, what, the Chinese government does not mind, spend, mind spending money, but it's the lack of results that really can be bad for your, uh, your career development if, in China if you're in the sector, or has been, quite frankly. Um, finally, the, the, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the supply chain uh, uh, breakdown that we discussed earlier when I was talking about regional specialization and the different steps. That really clues in the next uh, part of my, my lecture is kind of, you know, the final factor that led us to where we are today, and I'm going to get to the U.S. Chips and Science Act in a minute, but you have to understand it was really the breakdown in the semiconductor supply chain that resulted in an unprecedented shortage that kind of drove us to where we find ourselves today. A little bit of history on the shortage. At Commerce, we heard rumblings of the shortage at the very tail end of the Trump administration, especially from the auto industry. However, by the time the Biden and Harris administration had really taken over the reins of government, we had a full-fledged crisis uh, on our hands, and it was, it's even playing out now. The causes were many, and they were multiple points of failure, including planet pandemic shutdowns, snared logistics, uh, weather-related events and other single points of failure, but really it's the impact of the shortage that I want to talk about because it was the impact that really I think brought home to all of us here, I'm sure, is like, oh, semiconductors, what are these things, you know? Um, the most prominent example was the impact on the global automobile industry. And I, I think this is endemic of kind of, you can almost apply this to some of the other industries that were impacted, but global, the, the global auto industry uh, was really kind of the, the poster child of, of the effects of the shortage. Um, modern vehicles are really computers on wheels. They, and, and as they become increasingly reliant, or I should say as they become re re increasingly autonomous and increasingly reliant uh, on, on uh, you know, 
let me let me say that let me restate that um, they're becoming increasingly autonomous and they're becoming increasingly electrified so the semiconductor content for automobiles is actually accelerating and going through the roof um, during the shortage uh, for example you had seventy thousand dollar Ford F-150s, the latest, greatest F-150, rolling off assembly lines up into Detroit, but they were missing one chip. Not the latest, most advanced chip that's made in Taiwan or whatever, no. This was a tiny, relatively unsophisticated chip called a microcontroller that can cost just a few dollars. So for lack of a $3 chip, the, the auto industry couldn't get these automobiles to market and sell them. This piece of really, this, I would say this piece of silicon really brought the global auto, auto industry to its knees. Uh, you know, we witnessed, I mean, it wasn't just not selling the, the automobile. It was, you know, we, saw, we witnessed factories going idle because they could, didn't have any cars to make. Uh, auto workers were unable to make a paycheck, um, earn a paycheck. An incredibly powerful automobile uh, lobby was screaming for something to be done. So uh, just one more statistic on this, just to kind of bring it all home. According to MIT, when all was said and done in 2021, the global automobile industry is estimated that it lost 11 million vehicles that couldn't be sold, that weren't made, couldn't be sold. And that, that uh, added up to almost a shortage uh, or a loss of almost $200 billion because of uh, a $3 chip, right? And that's just the direct cost. You know, there's families and communities, entire ecosystems that support the industry that suffered as well. Um, it, last, it wasn't just the auto industry, you know, more concerning than autos that we were hearing, feeling calls from the medical device industry. There was medical technology that wasn't getting made or surfaced because they couldn't get access to chips. Um, and, and, you know, I understand not only that, the chips that they could get access to were, you know, on markups in the gray market of, of a thousand times. They were literally paying chips that cost, you know, multiple dollars were paying hundreds of dollars, sometimes multiple hundreds of dollars for chips that normally in normal times would have only cost a few dollars. You can imagine what the implications for the supply chain and for companies' bottom lines on that, and quite frankly, for the patients that require these life-sustaining devices. So let's review what got us here. Uh, we're coming to the CHIPS Act. Thank you for your patience. Over the last decade, we've witnessed geostrategic rivalry, aggressive industrial policy with over 200 billion in state subsidies, uh, declining U.S. semiconductor manufacturing capacity, and fragile supply chains. And I know that, these, that, that the fact that, that these were all the factors that led to the creation and fully funding of the Chips and Science Act. I know because I lived it. I was at Commerce when it was happening. I know the conversations were happening. And it was this kind of rising tide that really kind of just pushed it over. And I really had the privilege, quite frankly, to drive some of these policy changes. So the CHIPS law which would eventually become the Chips and Science Act, was authorized as part of the annual National Defense and Authorization Act on January 1st of 2021. At its foundation, the Chips Act uh, was designed to address what I've mentioned earlier, to address what the United States needed to rekindle its US semiconductor manufacturing base. It was also meant to lay the groundwork for future innovation and address the workforce challenges that have, quite frankly, uh, plagued the centuries for quite a few decades. Turn this back on and let's look at some. <laughs> so I'm going to leave this up here, but I'm going to talk through it. So that's for your viewing pleasure. So on the manufacturing side, uh, the law stipulated 39 billion for an incentive program that would ward up to $3 billion. Move on to the next slide. So you can see the numbers I'm talking about here. Uh, the incentive program would award up to $3 billion. And I'm quoting from the legislation here. It's very critically uh, the, the, the details here. So it's not just manufacturing is important. It's certainly look to address our manufacturing uh, deficit in this country. But according to the law, it looked up to $3 billion per project for constructing, modernizing, and expanding a facility for semiconductor manufacturing, assembly, a test, and advanced packaging R&D. It also included, I think in that definition, semiconductor manufacturing equipment and semiconductor materials. 
The second and more interesting part of the Chips and Science Act uh, was really looking at bo bolstering the U.S. capabilities in research and development. Um, namely, it's $11 billion for that. You see that here in the middle tile. Um, the main vector for the R&D spending of that $11 billion is going to be focused on the National Semiconductor Technology Center, which at its core is designed to bridge the gap between pre-competitive, basic research and development, and commercialization. What you need to know is in this country, we really haven't had a mechanism to take those kind of cutting edge designs, those cutting edge ideas, and move them over for mass, and prove that they work, and then ramp them up for mass commercialization. So what the NSTC is designed to do is bring together academia, industry, uh, and, and government, quite frankly, to come together to create a center where this can be done. Um, what has not been given much attention, but is also quite exciting, I think, is the $2 billion in funding for the Department of Defense that they, it also received from the, from the CHIPS Act. Now, I've always characterized the Department of Defense funds here as kind of like a mini CHIPS Act. They kind of got their own little mini CHIPS Act, uh, and it kind of really mirrors the bigger CHIPS Act. So their Microelectronics micro Commons effort, which is what it's called, is really focused on a national network for onshore university-based prototyping, kind of this lab-to-fab -fab transition, so transitioning those ideas to the manufacturing space uh, for DOD-specific applications. Uh, so that's that part of the CHIPS Act that I, I wanted to highlight because it doesn't get as much attention as I think it should. And I'll, I'll reiterate it's this, again, I, I've had this discussion with stakeholders you know, if it hadn't been for the shortage, we wouldn't see any of this. We, the CHIPS Act would have gotten funded at much lower level or not at all, I think, you know, if we, we hadn't. You know, it's the silver lining of the shortage, as I, as I said earlier. It finally brought home to the average American, people calling up their senators and their, their Congress people saying, hey, I can't get my car or my, 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 you know, my husband's out of work because of, uh, of this chip shortage. What are you going to do about it? So it really was kind of... Uh, the silver lining. So even given all these factors that I've kind of discussed, China, geostrategic, you know, competition, technology, all of this, you know, um, it was still kind of touch and go. It took, took eight, 18 months from the, the authorization language that happened January 1st of 2021 in the NDAA that I mentioned earlier to the actual funding it, which came through the Chips and Science Act. It took 18 months. And I tell you, there were, you know, the, the conversation, you know, the last six months before it actually got funded was, this is going to happen. Are we, are we going to snatch <laughs> defeat from the jaws of victory if we don't get this funding passed? And very, very happy that it actually did. And so it was June of last year that, that Biden signed uh, that. I'm going much slower than I expected. Apologies for that. Um, so really, what does it represent? It's a blueprint to strengthen the U.S. semiconductor supply chain, especially in manufacturing, while also laying the groundwork for semiconductor innovation leadership, so the kind of R&D running faster. It's also an important aspect of U.S. policy on semiconductors, and this has kind of gotten more play in the news, especially in D.C., is the, are the efforts being taken to kind of slow China down, basically. And those actions are a microcosm, I would say, of a, the broader geostrategic uh, uh, competition that has been brewing over the last decade. It's kind of, I think, when it came, it's come to the surface, and, and this is really kind of where it's been playing out initially, especially given the foundational nature of semiconductors and kind of the, the, the things that I spoke to earlier, kind of makes, uh, makes, the, makes the full picture. The other thing I want to talk about is kind of what the Biden administration is doing to kind of impede China's semiconductor industry development. Um, first, it restricted the export of advanced US, uh, US made semiconductor manufacturing equipment to China. And it gave a one year reprieve to those foreign semiconductor fabs are, are, that are already located in China. So, in addition to China's own domestic manufacturing capabilities, there's a lot of foreign companies that are actually manufacturing there as well. And they were given a one year reprieve allowed to bring in those US semiconductor, uh, that US semiconductor technology. And this is really interesting. This is unprecedented. Second, it banned U.S. citizens and permanent residents from working at Chinese semiconductor companies. This is a huge blow to China, as many of the senior executives at, the, at many of the China's major domestic 
uh, semiconductor companies were educated and trained in the United States and hold U.S. permanent residence or U.S. citizenship. So it, it was quite unprecedented and it surprised all of us in the policy community. Um, third, the United States banned the export of the most advanced uh, GPUs or graphic processing units uh, from going to China to kind of throttle China's uh, its work on it, uh, advanced artificial intelligence systems and kind of basically impair Beijing's uh, ambitions to becoming an AI powerhouse. Finally, it restricted that U.S. EDA, if you remember from the beginning, electronic design automation, where the U.S. kind of dominates the market share for that particular segment of the supply chain. The U.S. banned uh, it from being used uh, for the most cutting edge chips in China. It was an escalation of Trump era export restrictions on Huawei that curbed the firm's access to foreign firms, uh, foreign chips, I should say. And it really, as I said, it kind of shocked Washington. What's really where we are now on that is those restrictions were put on unilaterally. And as I mentioned at the top of my talk, both it's not just the US that dominates the equipment manufacturing space. It's also the Netherlands and Japan. So what's been happening in DC recently is a conversation. We recently had the prime minister of the Netherlands there. We, uh, prime Minister Kishida was there as well because we really need the Japan and the Netherlands to kind of put in comparable restrictions for them to actually be effective. Okay, where are we now? So let's fast forward to today, January 25th, 2023. Uh, the DOD has been first out of the gate with their DOD microelectronics uh, efforts. They have actually put out what's called a re request for solutions. It's basically, hey, tell us what you've got. So there's a lot of academic institutions partnering with state governments, partnering with industry right now that are filling out applications and getting ready to submit an application to the Department of Defense for this DOD funding under microelectronics commons. So that, you know, that's out there right now. Um, Commerce obviously has the biggest uh, chunk of chip and some implementations and money. So on the incentive program, now we're here, we're here we're right now. The incentive program, we're expecting to see a notice of funding opportunity within February. Now I've confirmed that with people in the know that Commerce will be issuing that funding opportunity in February next month. And that's really going to be, that's when we hit, the, the starter gun goes off and those, those incentives are going to be available to companies to, to, to build out their projects in the United States. Uh, finally, in February, we're also expected to see the Department of Commerce's white paper. They've, you know, they had six months, they've been working on implementation and how they're going to structure the R&D side of the CHIPS implementation. So what we're going to see in February is really Commerce's thoughts, and the U.S. government's thoughts on how they're going to implement the CHIPS R&D efforts. And so that will be an opportunity for the public to come and say, hey, you've got this right, you got this wrong, and also kind of get a peek in to see what, what, uh, what the, the U.S. government is thinking as far as the next stage of R&D development and, and CHIPS funding for, for R&D efforts. Um, last, some last thoughts uh, before I conclude. Um, this is going to be really hard. It's going to be really hard. Commerce has really never undertaken an initiative of this scale before. Um, the CHIPS program was funded as 50, at $52 billion, as I mentioned earlier. Can anyone, can anyone here guess what the annual budget for the entire Department of Commerce is, which contains like 12 different business units? It's $11.5 billion. So the CHIPS program by itself is five times the Commerce budget. Um, and it's not just the funding, which is substantial, it's the impact that this effort, it's really a once in a generation opportunity to drive the future, you know, that will drive, it'll have an impact on the future of US-China strategic competition and the future of chip innovation writ large. Um, second, implementation is going to require new models of cooperation. Cooperation between governments, both the federal and state level, with companies up and down the semiconductor value chain and academia as well. It's also gonna require new modalities for cooperation between the chip makers and the downstream users. That doesn't quite frankly exist as it should in my opinion right now. I mean, for example, back to the auto industry that we mentioned earlier, um, part of the reason the auto industry was so impacted by the shortage was somewhat felt self-inflicted. Uh, they had, and you know, Jim Farley, the CEO of Ford, said this in an event about three or four months ago. They really did not have a, 
an understanding, an appreciation of the semiconductor supply chain and how integral chips were to their manufacturing process and how much, trans or how much visibility they really needed. They really just saw it as another part, another you know, catalytic converter. It's just another chip, right? Um, and my final word on cooperation uh, is focused on the federal government. Um, there are a lot of agencies with deep equities in the semiconductor, especially the Department of Defense. So CHIPS legislation is really an important opportunity for the federal government to bring together all the equities, all the expertise within the federal government to really make this a, a, a success. Um, finally, the last thing I'll say is workforce, workforce, workforce. One thing that's been coming up to the forefront uh, since we've actually passed the CHIPS Act among policymakers, the people in academia who know about this, who've known about this for years, is there's been a dearth of workforce, of talent for this industry for, for decades. And now we're about to embark upon a major build out of manufacturing capacity, of R&D centers, of R&D efforts. And we don't really have in this country enough people to, 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 to work in those fabs, to, to you know, stand up that and understand the implications and microelectronics commons. All of these efforts are gonna require talent and expertise that we just don't have. So what I'd like to say and what I'd like to leave you with is the importance of, of workforce. And I personally would love to see an effort the size of the original CHIPS Act for workforce development specific to this sector. It is necessary, it is needed, and it, it, it's, it's, it's got to happen or this is not going to work. And that's the last thing I'm gonna leave with you. So thank you very much. I really appreciate your time and I, I'm, I, welcome, I welcome your questions. Is my mic on? Yes, it is on. So as you formulate your questions, I had a mea culpa moment, though. Thank you so much, Travis, for coming today. But I forgot to thank two other organizations in my long list of organizations I thanked. Of course, the Goldman School of Public Policy, <laughs> proudly displayed behind Travis, and then also the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity. So thank you again for your support. Uh, we'll be running around. If you have questions, please raise your hand. And while they're doing that, I'm just going to let you guys know this is the grail for CHIPS information. CHIPS.gov is the commerce site. Everything that's happening is on there. You can sign up for email alerts. It's very detailed. It's very much a government website. So, you know, look past that. But that's, <laughs> that's where it's at. And then the other, of course, it's separate. DOD gets their own separate thing. The Microelectronics Commons, the other effort under CHIPS Act, is at this website. So I encourage you to get on there, especially given in February we're going to see a lot, a lot of action coming out of uh, the Department of Commerce on chips implementation. Yes. Oh, well, thank you uh, for the talk, for the uh, context you provided. My question is like, why are we not seeing like collaboration in the space? Why does it have to be a zero sum game? It seems like, it, like to me, it sounds like you know it could be like a waste of resources, and because of this, you know, geopolitical competition, it could be you know, first of all, waste of resources. Second of all, I think um, also it just it will impede the progress of you know, like us combating uh, climate change, right? Because I, I think, yeah, that, that's my question. Okay. So there's all kinds of collaboration um, that you could be talking to, speaking to. The main reason why collaboration is important in this sector is because this stuff is really, really, really hard. Whether it's the technology, where it's, whether it's how to properly, you know, spend the $52 billion in a way that's going to be effective and, and, and is going to... Um, be responsive to the taxpayer and to the public. Uh, also collaboration, I, I, which I didn't mention, but it's also critical is, you know, we have allies and partners that are also looking at how to incentivize the semiconductor industry. And given the technological challenges, the complexity of, of getting the next stage in R&D right, uh, making sure that we're not, for example, duplicating investments with Europe, for example. I mean, we need to get this right. We need to collaborate in order to make sure that our investments, that the technology roadmaps, that all of these things, because now I can tell you the, the complexity of it now is to such a degree, at least on the technology side, with the, the kind of coming to the end of Moore's law, that, that there's no one country or one company that can tackle this alone. If we, if we could, we would have done it already. But it's, it's getting more expensive, getting more complex, and that's why collaboration is really, really important. Question here. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, there's a lot out. 
about the lack of engineering talent here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, for some of the manufacturing requirements, specifically from TSMC. Um, I know you spoke at the macro level, but uh, but you ended it with the workforce requirements. Can you speak a little more about maybe um, some specific programs that are underway to uh, figure out how we can increase our engineering talent yeah. uh, to meet this need You know, within the next decade? So one good, wonderful that I didn't speak to, because uh, it is a highly complex and uh, uh, very detailed uh, legislation, and there was a 200 million in funding that was appropriated to uh, that was funded for the NSF to look at how to increase work. And I, I feel I see Dr. Uh, Dean Lewis looking at me here. She she's an amazing. We're a national treasure here. They've got uh, NSF is 200 million dollars to to work on on semiconductor workforce development. But that's what I'm saying. We actually need more funding, more attention at the level that we have for the, the CHIPS Act on, on manufacturing incentives and R&D, we also need it for workforce. So I think one of the things you're gonna see come out of, of implementation is you've got this effort at DOD, the Microelectronics Commons, which is really also focused on workforce. They're looking at new models for cooperation, how to incentivize, how do we work with community colleges? How do we even work at, look at you know, kids coming out of high school? There, there are roles there for them. How do we reach out to HCBUs? Or how do we reach out to you know, the communities or uh, underserved communities that have been out of this process? There are resources there that haven't been tapped that we, we, we can tap. The other thing that, this is, this is my idea, is that there's a lot, it's not just the United States that's impacted by the, the dearth of talent for the semiconductor industry. It's really some of our allies and our partners. And you think, talk about Japan, or you talk about Korea or EU. I mean, they're having the same issue. So my, my question is, are there opportunities there to learn best practices, to talk about how they approach semi, you know, education? Are there some connections that can be made uh, with universities, for example? Or how do we, you know, th these, some of these companies have industry footprints across the world. You know, look at Micron or you look at Qualcomm. They have design teams here and manufacturing teams here and R&D teams here. How do we bring in uh, into that equation, into that cooperation that's already ongoing between the governments on semiconductor supply chain, how you bring in worse force discussions into that, and kind of, you know, we're, again, no one country, no one company can figure this all out, so it's, we're going to have to engage with stakeholders across the community and across the world. Yeah, uh, thanks. I had a quick question for you. Uh, this was a wonderful presentation so far. Let's go down one level. Yeah and talk about strategic vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. And one of them in particular relates to lithography mm -hmm. as a stage in the design flow design process. In case anybody wonders why he kept saying the Netherlands, it's because all the advanced lithography tools come from the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. um, having the US not have a play in that particular segment of the design flow is strategically risky for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is any element of this act and the monies available directed specifically at onshoring lithography technology for EUV and X-ray lithography as the next generation comes online? Uh, it's, a, it's a good question. I would indirectly say yes. Um, one of the smart things about the CHIPS Act, when you talk about these incentives, these manufacturing incentives, it's not just for U.S. companies, right? I mean, obviously, there's, there's some Countries that companies from countries that, that including China that aren't aren't eligible. The vast majority of our allies and partners, the companies from those countries, are eligible. You're going to see, for example, you're, you're certainly going to see. T I'm going to get to to the, the answer to this, but you're going to see t likes of Samsung, TSMC, uh, some of the major players. They're going to be applying for incentives and probably being awarded them. Along that vein, uh, we're also seeing investments by ASML. Right? I know they're not an, uh, a U.S. company. They are bringing some of those capabilities on shore, which is the whole purpose of the CHIPS Act is to incentivize some of the technologies that we don't have here, but that our allies and partners or companies from our allies and partners have to incentivize that investment here in the United States. So kind of no, no U.S. company, but we are trying to bring that capability here. And so that's kind of what the CHIPS Act is for. So you, you mentioned that... Uh... American nationals and residents are, are forbidden from working at uh, Chinese semiconductor companies because of this act. And I wonder uh, what fraction of like domestic semiconductor workers in the U.S. are Chinese nationals and what this means for them. It's a great question and a huge, I, I, I do know that a huge part of that is, uh, you know, a, a lot of the workforce here in the academic community are Chinese based nationals. I haven't heard any restrictions or anything like that. I mean, you know, we have a very 
open immigration environment here, I think, compared with a lot of countries. And I think we just need to leverage the talent in a way that is going to you know, bring, the, bring the most benefit. Uh, and, and we need to think creatively about how we do that. So you know, moving forward, I think there's opportunities across the spectrum from, from, for students from all, you know, many countries to kind of come in, because this is where it's at. This is where it's happening. A lot of the best R&D is done here in the United States. So I think there's a lot of opportunities across the spectrum, across countries to come here and, and participate in, in the ecosystem. I thank you for the excellent talk. I have two questions. One, you mentioned that the Chinese government had poured billions of dollars into trying to you know, create a semiconductor capability, and essentially they failed so far. What makes us think that we can do it uh, better? Uh, our, you know, our record with industrial policy is not stellar, right? Mm -hmm. Generally, industrial policy isn't stellar around the world. Mm -hmm. There are a few examples, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, but generally in the Western world, we haven't been very good at doing that. Certainly not very good at picking winners mm -hmm. in industrial policy senses. So what, 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 what has changed? What do we think is, is different? And the second question is related to that. Mm -hmm. At the last meeting of the, um, North American leaders. So you had a meeting in Mexico City with uh, President Biden, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, the Mexican president. Mm -hmm. yeah. There was a lot of emphasis on the semiconductors. And there's this idea that somehow North America is a big player. Obviously, the United States is. I don't know how much Canada is doing in this space. But certainly, Mexico isn't a player at all right now. But there's some hope that it can become one. Is that is that feasible? Is that realistic? Or is this, is this uh, pie in the sky? thinking? Those are two great questions. Um, on industrial policy, yeah, I mean, we don't do industrial policy. I mean, during the Obama administration, was I was trying to convince anybody who would listen that we needed to kind of have a whole government. I wasn't saying industrial policy. I was just like, we need a whole government strategy for the China threat. Uh, it, was, it was crickets, like anything that had a whiff of industrial policy. Now, we're in, a new, we're in a new, much to my shock, quite frankly, we're in a new paradigm. Um, if there, I will, I like to say, you know, we're doing industrial policy with U.S. characteristics. And what does that mean? What do I mean by that, right? Uh, we're bringing in, first of all, we have first mover advantage. We already have a lot of advantages here. So we're, we're accelerating advantages we already have. The second thing we did right is we're bringing in uh, expertise from offshore, from our allies and partners. And that ASML example I mentioned earlier is a prime example. I know there's another company I can't name that is about to is planning on building a huge R and D facility uh, that will transform the industry. In industry, right? Those are investments. I think would, with the thing you also have to understand with the capacity increases here, those factories are going to build, be built somewhere, right? And that what we're doing with the incentive program is basically we're incentivizing them to come to the United States instead of going to Taiwan or going to China or going to Southeast Asia or wherever they're going. Uh, the third component is, I mean, it's a holistic approach, right? We're, we're, I, in design, it's really brilliant, and it has that workforce. We recognize the challenges of the workforce, so we've got a workforce component. And what I didn't mention, because the, de the you know, details are, are significant, is for the incentive program, if you're applying for incentive, you have to have a roadmap of your engagement, and how you're going to engage with local communities and local colleges and local you know, universities to have programs for semiconductor industry, you know, to, you know, for the semiconductor industry, for all the all segments, so that's a requirement of the incentive program. So all to say is there are these there are these things in there, and if you look at it holistically, it's it's dealing with manufacturing capacity. Yes, it's looking at uh, cutting edge things like advanced packaging and, and trying to bring some of that that capability onshore. It's looking at the future. It's got those R and D dollars. It's looking at engaging with our foreign allies and partners and bringing their capabilities and you know, working with them and understand how we can work together to address technological challenges or, or, or making sure we're not having companies uh, bidding against each other, you know, kind of a race to the bottom when these incentive programs get. Because then that's something else I didn't mention, right? We've got EU, we've got Japan that are also <laughs> have started their own ships act. So we've got to make sure that those aren't competing investments, right? So yes, it's industrial policy with US characteristics. I think we've done it smartly. It really is going to come down to implementation. To your second question about Mexico and Canada. Uh, you know, Canada really doesn't have a role in the semiconductor industry. Uh, I mean, if you look at the global footprint of what's happening, it's really, I mean, not, not a really major player. Mexico has some back-end testing facilities. Um, what I think they're looking at is, and it's going to be a medium to long-term goal, is, is how do you build up that kind of back-end 
capacity. So you have all these new fabs being being built in Arizona, or you got know, Oregon, and, and, and you know, or you anywhere in the country. Quite frankly, you can easily ship it to Mexico, but they're really looking regionally. Is how do you build it and then send it right over the border to have it packaged and tested to make sure it functions as it's supposed to. So I think in the medium to long term, you're going to see a bigger role for Mexico in the semiconductor supply chain. It's quite limited now, but it's going to take some time. Sorry, that was a long answer, but it was a good question. Absolutely. Uh, hi, I'm a longtime writer and researcher on industrial policy. So I actually am coming at it from the opposite direction of the previous questioner. So it seems like if China has spent 200 billion and we've got a $50 billion bill that was passed, wh why wasn't it bigger? I mean, shouldn't we have spent at least 200 billion? That's my first question. Yeah, okay. um, the second question is, you know, having studied when industrial policy works, which it did work in a lot of cases in China um, and in a number of cases in the US and Europe. It seems like what really makes it work is when there's a lot of competition and the private sector plays a key role in the implementation. So why is commerce implementing this? Why isn't it being left to the private sector? Then my third question, if you have time, is why did it fail in China or did it? Remind me of your first question again. <laughs> <laughs> it was, is the bill too small? Should we be oh, spending no. more? Well, yeah, no, it's a great question because, you know, if you, if all of us know, any of us know, or know in this industry know that $52 billion is a drop in the bucket, right? What is not explicit here is this is really seed money. We're, we're hoping to see, uh, you know, in kind contributions in these projects that these companies are building. They're asking for the Delta. They're like, okay, we're not going to build it in Japan. You're making up the delta, so but we're building a, a $10 billion facility. So only $3 billion from the US government is, is, is contributing to a $13 billion facility, right? So, you know, that is, you know, a small amount, but it's going to have those kind of knock on echo effects. Um, what's been fascinating to me is without $1 of federal funding going out the door yet, we already have all these announcements of, of, of projects here. I mean, you, you, Small to big, you've got a, a wafer manufacturer uh, from Taiwan that you know came to the United States. He's already committed to building. Taiwan has built that twelve billion dollar fab without one dollar of promised federal funding. You know they're they're going to expand that. So it's it's amazing to see without even one dollar going out the door how much activity, hundred billion dollars up in New York from from Micron, which is a major uh, memory maker. I mean it's it's just, it's phenomenal. Okay, second question. <laughs> So in the drafting of the CHIPS Act, I can promise you, I know for a fact that the private sector was in there, was saying, yes, no. You had Congress in there saying, well, we can do this, we can't do that. You had the administration, because it was during the Trump administration this was drafted, was saying, you know, working as kind of the honest broker trying to, to find that common ground. So it was, had a lot of industry input in the drafting of it. Um, one thing you'll hear coming out of the mouths of a lot of folks from commerce and the US government is this got to be industry driven, right? We're just providing, see, we, when you look at the R&D efforts, the National Semi-Technology -Tech Center, I th the government is 100% looking for the, gov the, for the industry and academia to drive the, the priorities on that. You know, what, what are they going to focus on? How is it going to go work? The organizational structure. They're going to step back, they, you know, make sure everybody's playing nice and kind of be the honest broker, but they really is going to have that. It's going to be uh, an industry and academic driven exercise. Um, and then the third question. A stake-directed investment. It wasn't market-driven. Is the is the is the short answer. Um, you know, if I if I were in charge, I wouldn't have tried to do everything. China tried to do everything. They 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 wanted to, they wanted to be players in the equipment sector. They wanted to have this major manufacturing footprint. Uh, they wanted the, the the cutting edge. They wanted the middle, and they wanted the tail. Uh, and they they it was spread too thin. Uh, I think there was a lot of um, uh, slosh in the in the in the market. There was a lot. For example, there were a lot of companies that, that all of this money was sloshing around. You had a lot of companies that would s set up a, a semiconductor company to get the, the federal incentives, and then six months later, that company was gone. And you had failure of, of hundreds of companies literally over a period of a couple of years. So, I mean, there's a lot of factors that, that uh, went into it, but uh, those were just some of them. Okay, is it working? Right. Hello, sir. Thank you for the speech. I'm Hamid, an econ student. I have a quick question. When it comes to the most advanced technology like the four to five nanometers chips mm -hmm. 
should we expect uh, in the next decade, for example, should we expect the already established companies, the big companies like Micron, Intel, or let's say TSMC to bring its manufacturing, to advance manufacturing back home? Or do you think we will see new entries to that side of the industry? No, I mean, well, for five nanometer, I mean, that's the fab that TSMC is building right now is going to be it's going to be the most advanced technology we have here on shore. Um, you know, the, the dynamics of the industry really, uh, really favor established players because it's so complicated. It's so expensive. So, I mean, you're really going to need to see a, a shift in technology, kind of almost like a, a like when we went from vacuum tubes to, 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 to integrated circuits. Kind of that major shift for a new player. I personally think, for, sorry, for a new player, a new entrant to really make an impact, you would need to like move away from silicon-based CMOS technology for that to happen. Right now, the advances are going to be, in my opinion, going to be made by the big companies. And if the CHIPS Act works well, maybe in, co in, in conjunction with academia and, and the government as well. But, but we have that and expect more of it to come on shore as, as we implement the CHIPS Act and see, see more of that funding and those, those manufacturing uh, projects come online. Thank you again, Travis. If everybody could please thank Travis for me. Thank you. Thank you.